All right, so we're back and uh, this is sort of an overview slide. So we're going to talk about um, the two main types of concepts. There are logical concepts and then there are natural concepts. I've so far kind of been talking about natural concepts. So let's go ahead and talk about logical concepts first. Um, so logical concepts. Logical concepts are ones that are based on a set of rules that are set up for the purposes of an experiment. This is not real life. This is like, we want to find out how you think by giving you these fake concepts that we made up, right? And we want you to be figuring out the set of rules and that'll show us how you make comparisons in real life probably. Um, but we're, we're teaching it to you right now. Um, the reason why we would teach you rules is because if you already came in with a really strong association between a particular concept and a particular exemplar, we would never know exactly how you process information because you may just process it really quickly and we think, oh, that's actually a rare thing and you think it's a common thing. It's all, it's all imprecise. So in order to get control over situ the situation, we're going to have nobody coming in knowing anything about what we're talking about in this experiment and we're going to teach you a set of, learn of, of rules um, that then you're going to apply to experimental materials. Um, it's really typical in traditional concept identification studies. Like this is how you um, would set up a study if you wanted to see how a person organizes their concepts. Like this is how you do it. Um, there's the reception paradigm approach where um, you present items, a list of items in a random order and ask the subjects to categorize those items. Um, the thing about this is that you're present, presenting them the items one by one and so this involves some memory as the participant that has to sit there and remember what things they've seen so far and what they want to put together. It's not happening all out in like on a screen or on a table. It's happening in their memory. So that can be kind of taxing. The selection paradigm, we go ahead and give you all the items simultaneously and we ask you to cat categorize them. The nice thing about this strategy is that we can watch you as you're trying to figure out how to categorize these materials. Um, they're not naturally occurring categories. You have to impose some kind of meaning on the things that we've given you. And so we can kind of watch to see how you decide that. Um, I, was watching, I was watching a YouTube channel. Um, I think it's called the Midwest cleaning or something and this guy has a cleaning company but he does free um, clean outs for people with hoarding disorders and um, so one of the big things that people ask him is how do you even get started when the place is full like how do you even get started and he says I just try and find anything that looks like it could go together and start making piles I start moving it I start placing things. He doesn't clean it out and throw everything away because that is not how you help a person with hoarding disorder. Um, so he tries to impose some kind of organization on the things that he's facing. Sometimes there's easier things. It's food or it's not food. It's, you know, like sometimes it's kind of easy, but sometimes he'll have objects that need to be, you know, not thrown away, but need to be put into a position so they're just not, you know, burying the house anymore and he has to impose me and I have to tell you it is mesmerizing for me to watch him do this he, it's all sped up so I watch it really fast and uh, he figures out a way to make this tote be one that he very consistently will put things in occasionally I'll see him take something out of that tote and put it into a different tote so you can tell he's sort of on the fly solving the problem of how to make this tote make sense for the person later when they're going to, as part of their treatment, they um, will start sorting through these totes and figuring out what to keep and what to get rid of. But you can't just dump a person's belongings and think that's going to solve their problem. You got to give them a chance to, to heal themselves and then be able to work through it. And so he's doing a great service for these people, but um, you know, he, you can watch him live trying to impose um, organization categorizing he'll say this is the tote that I'm going to be putting everything that's blue into or something I don't know what he's doing because he doesn't talk and um, then periodically he'll take one out put it into a different tote um, take another tote move it over here it's like very great example of the selection paradigm in it real in real life um, in grouping strategies we're going to again we've got all the items presented simultaneously and we're going to see um, 
the person and actually they might it might be presented in stages I'm going to give you an example where it's pre, um, presented in stages but the person needs to group the items based on some kind of attribute or some kind of rule that's been provided or that they have to discover on their own they have to figure out what the theme is um, what is the rule that's governing this so here's an example of that so here I've presented all the items to you all at one time so these are all the items that you're gonna see so just to name them because it's kinda weird on a PowerPoint what do I mean by these mark so the top is a red square the a big red square the next one is a big red circle the next one is a small red circle the next one is a I don't I guess it's a green circle I meant for it to be a white circle but the background's green so I don't know um, and then the bottom is a small green circle all right so we'll just go along with it and it's green okay so if I told you that the big green square is a member of the concept you're going to process that information as I say it you're going to start to try and figure out okay what characteristics make up this concept right so the big red square is a member of the concept the big red circle is also a member of the concept the small red circle is not a member of the concept the big green circle is a member of the concept the small green circle is not a member of the concept okay so you probably started to have a pretty good guess when I showed you the no on the small red circle you probably had a pretty good strong guess and then by the time I showed you the big green circle you were probably completely confident that you knew what characteristics make up the concept that you're dealing with right you're we know big is probably the key feature of this concept right that you have to be a big one either circle or square and you can be either red or you can be green it doesn't matter color doesn't matter shape doesn't matter you need to be big to be a member of this concept right so you probably figured that out you were probably starting to develop a hypothesis after you saw the big red circle was a member and then the small red circle probably really drove it home you're like I think I know and then absolutely if you had any question left in your mind the big green circle helped you to know that you were for sure you knew it um, so what's going on there um, so when you first start off trying to solve the problem you will probably display what's called conservative focusing which is where all the attributes are equally relevant you're just trying to figure out the like what's going to be important um, one feature at a time gets changed right so we give you one hint a big red square okay that's everything it could be big it could be red it could be square that's important second one big red circle okay so it could be big it could be red that's important but certainly it doesn't matter if it's a circle or a square so then we get down to the small red circle you know for sure the key factor is size not color um, so you change one thing at a time that's a really effective method for actually distilling down what's important for this concept um, I normally in class like to ask students do you think this is what we naturally do most of the time because <laughs> probably not in real life we probably don't change one variable at a time and see if it's still true or false right we kind of do a little bit more what we call focus gambling where maybe we go ahead and risk varying two attributes at a time so we might just go ahead and jump down to the no on the small circle without confirming the yes on the big square and the yes on the big circle right um, when we're right we learn the concept really quickly we say oh right on I see I get it it's about size um, but if we're wrong we actually have to go back and try and figure out why we're wrong I'd like to throw in one more detail about focus gambling that's a problem which is that when we're wrong and we find out that we're wrong a lot of times in real life we don't find out that we're wrong and so we go through life having categorized details that don't actually go together but we have assumed that they go together it's called an illusory correlation and uh, so a lot of times we never find out that we're wrong until like way down the road and then we're like wait I always thought this is how the world works and, you know I never got the feedback before that I actually um, you know change too many variables at one time and jump to a wrong conclusion 
Um, but in real life, we tend to display a lot more focused gambling. Um, in experimental conditions, we can sort of be led to doing the conservative focusing that's much more likely to produce um, correct interpretations. Now, the other side would be the natural concepts, right? And so natural concepts typically have what we call fuzzy borders. Um, what that means is the difference between, um, you know, this coordinate member um, and that coordinate member, you know, those low levels, you know, canary versus ostrich, typically they have fuzzy boundaries. Like what distinguishes a, um, I'm trying to think of two very similar birds that we might all be able to visualize. Um, one that I've been struggling with lately is seagull versus osprey. Because um, when you see them flying, they look different, but when they're sitting still, they kind of have some similarities. Um, so what distinguishes these two different members of the category of, you know, bird, right? It's, uh, they tend to be fuzzy. They have a lot of overlapping characteristics. Um, natural concepts tend to have prototypical examples. For most natural concepts, your mind has its own prototype of what that concept is that you can generate really easily. You can visualize the prototype for just about every natural concept that you hold. And that's because you figured out what belongs to that concept through your experience with different example, examples of the concept. Um, natural concepts are probabilistic. Like I was saying earlier, you know, you probably literally go through the world with your brain, not you voluntarily, but just your brain, sort of ticking away the likelihood that this thing in front of you belongs to this category or that a member of the category would have this characteristic. It's, you probably are um, doing sort of a little statistical analysis all the time and probabilistic means that there is a knowable likelihood of uh, an occurrence. Um, now none of us want to do the math on the likelihood but it's, it's, it's possible to do the math on the likelihood that you would meet a, a, a mem, you know, a, an exemplar of a concept that it actually, actually matches your prototype, right? Actually has the characteristics of your prototype. There's a knowable probability. We could calculate it. I can't, but someone could. Um, and so when dealing with natural concepts, we oftentimes display like the availability heuristic, right? That tendency to believe that just because we can think of a case, it must be really common. So just because I can imagine a robin, I must have seen a lot of robins, right? Um, that's the availability heuristic. If it's easy to think of, it must be common. And so natural concepts, we tend to have that kind of um, experience with them. All right, you may have seen this picture before in your life, maybe not. Um, it's one of these ambiguous figures. One of the things that they say about this ambiguous figure is that whichever creature you have more experience with is what you'll tend to see in this, in this figure. So if you're more familiar with seeing ducks, you'll probably see this figure first and foremost most easily as a duck. If you're more familiar with seeing bunnies, you're more likely to see it as a bunny. Um, looking out my window, I not only have chipmunks, I also have bunnies that run around. And weirdly, for the first time, looking at this ambiguous figure, I actually am seeing the bunny more easily. And I think it's because I've got a lot of bunnies in my yard right now. Um, I used to see the duck much more easily. Um, but it's supposed to be the case that if you have seen a lot more of one type of these creatures, um, it's more available to you. And so you will see ambiguous things as examples of the thing that you're used to seeing right, the thing that you're more familiar with. The representativeness heuristic is another example of how probabilistic natural concepts are. You know, I, here we have a person who, if you glance at him and I, if I forced you to say, what do you think this person does for a living? My guess is you'd either say professor or maybe lawyer. Like he looks like a 1950s lawyer to me. <laughs> I'd say professor in the English department. <laughs> Or this is my stereotype. So um, this person's appearance most closely matches my prototype of either the concept of English professor or 
maybe even law professor. I think I'll say law professor rather than lawyer. I think I'll say law professor or English professor. But with the patches on the elbow, the pipe, the book, um, all the tweed, it kind of represents a lot of the features that go along with, I don't know, maybe even I would want to go out on a limb and say like, it's a professor at Harvard or um, at uh, Oxford or one of these places that, you know, is much more classical. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that this person looks like a member of the English department at our school. I might say a more classical school, right? So that's, um, that's a good example of how the representativeness heuristic is um, illustrating our tendency for these fuzzy boundary kind of prototypical examples um, all these categories all these characteristics of, of a of a natural concept now there are different kinds of categories as well I've been trying I've been semi mixing category and concept together um, when we talk about categories um, there's the verbal context that can help us to determine what belongs to what category and what belongs to another category right um, in this example there were experimental conditions where um, they the person was just told name the object and they went they were shown each of these objects one by one and they were supposed to name the objects and one of the things about these natural categories that you're seeing here is it's hard it, the fuzzy boundaries are illustrated in this picture right like where is the dividing line between cup and bowl where's the dividing line between cup and like chalice <laughs> um, or box like where is the dividing line it's the fuzzy boundaries are there um, so in the experimental condition using this stimuli some participants were asked to just name the object and that did reveal the fuzzy boundaries and then others were provided context like imagine the object is full of mashed potatoes what would you call the object and what you see is that you know numbers one through four were much more likely to be labeled as bowls in that context than if they were told imagine that you're seeing this object at a dinner table they might be more likely to label them as cups or or glasses or something like that imagine you're drinking coffee from it I mean really honestly if you ever saw the TV show friends I think they drink their coffee out of either number two or number three I'm not sure and uh, they did look like bowls of coffee honestly but we recognize them as coffee cups when we think about them as coffee so now think about it where would be the breakoff point between a coffee cup and a bowl and I'd say probably number four is the closest thing to a bowl probably now that I'm imagining coffee and then I would probably say, I'm still going to put, see, I would say number 16 now. That makes sense. I'm having like Irish coffee. I might say number 17 is the only thing that's no longer a, appropriate for me now. Um, that seems like something that should have wine or something in it. I don't know. Um, 18 and 19, I'm still struggling with those. Those feel a lot like boxes to me. But um, So you can imagine that the, the things might be clustered differently based on what you're imagining inside of them. And that's what they found in the research. This study, this kind of um, verbal context helped to reveal the fuzzy boundaries that are present in natural categories, right? Like where's the break off from one and the start of the other. Um, now, a lot of times people, when they aren't sure, they use what I've identified previously in lecture. Um, they use a hedge to try and explain, well, that kind of looks like one of the cups that they drank out of on Friends. Or, you know what, that kind of looks like a beer stein. Or, you know, that kind of looks like the kind of co a cup that you would drink Irish coffee out of. Um, oh, that kind of looks like a, a bowl that I have at home. Um, things like that. that. That kind of is a hedge. It's like, okay, this isn't a perfect match, but I'm trying to make a justification for why I'm seeing it as a member of that category or not. Um, so we oftentimes see people um, using hedges in that, that sort of circumstance. Now, linguistic context and judgment, you might be like, wait, how is verbal different from linguistic? Linguistic context and, and judgments where we're asking them to um, make decisions about um, stimuli. We don't see a consistent set of exemplars or a single prototype emerge. Um, the examples representativeness will be judged based on the linguistic context usually. So let me give you some examples. So like semantic categories. Um, so if we ask you whether 
a chair is representative of the concept of furniture versus whether we um, whether you think a rocking chair is representative of the concept of furniture right like these are semantic cat categories furniture chair rocking chair um, you can imagine that maybe you have your concept of furniture organized something like this we have like this overarching superordinate category of furniture and then maybe it's divided up into big categories underneath that you know subordinate categories and under the subordinate category of chair you might have you know coordinate level rocking chairs recliners things like that um, and so the more family re resemblance that a an exemplar has so under the category of chair having four legs having a flat seat having a back um, the more of those things that it, that the exemplar has, the, the more likely you are to think that it's a member of that category. And so rocking chair might suffer because, yeah, it has four legs, but they rock, right? So it might take you a second to go, is a rocking chair furniture? Is a rocking chair a chair? Um, you may have to think about it a little harder than if you were presented with like a dining room chair or, um, you know, a typical like schoolroom chair or something like that. Um, typically, subordinate category members are easier to visualize than the superordinate category. Like the concept of furniture is a lot harder to visualize than, um, you know, the concept of chair. You can generate a prototypical chair in your mind a lot easier than you can a prototypical furniture. Like you probably might think about a chair or a couch, but you have to decide which one is what. Which kind of furniture am I thinking of? Whereas with the concept of chair, you can very quickly think of an of an, uh, an exemplar. All right, so let's put this all together. I feel, I feel like this chapter needs a good wrap up because it seems like it's a little bit disjointed. It's not categorical enough. Um, so think about the semantic memory store, which we've, we've addressed before, and think about how, you know, it's got that procedural memory, it's got, um, you know, some propositional aspects, you know, with the things that you know that you know. Um, this allows for you to become an expert in certain things, right, because you know what you know. Um, think about the semantic memory context, contents and how the semantic memory is structured and the structure of semantic memory probably falls some to some degree into one of these theories um, uh, that we talked about you know the the teachable learning comprehender i shortened it to tlc you know it argues for the existence of hierarchies um, the use of cognitive economy um, it displays the category size effect right the spreading activation model um, talks about interrelated nodes it talks about distance determining the strength of the association and then the feature set theory um, says that we match features to the categories um, probably these things all work together in some fashion and if you kind of think about well in the spreading activation model what's not to, what's to say that you couldn't have a hierarchical structure right and in the feature set theory maybe in that hierarchy are the different features that belong to the categories so there's there's really nothing that makes these um, uh, po you know, opposed to each other, and they probably do it all each explain part of the semantic memory structure. Um, keep in mind the difference between a logical category and a natural category, right? Um, we can use those logical categories to really give us insight into how people process new information and try and ca form categories or concepts, and um, we can attempt to explain natural categories by using concepts like the representativeness heuristic and the availability heuristic to explain how people, and hedges and other can things to explain how people use categories in the real world. So, all right, well, that concludes what I think is like the most exciting and interesting to talking about chapter nine. So I'll see you next in chapter 10.